the next session to the first which was about the mouth and the salivary glands is concerning about the connection between the mouth and the stomach this connection is made by uh, tubes the upper one is the pharynx and it is a uh, voluntary structure and as you go down it is going to be the esophagus which is a combination of voluntary and involuntary structure uh, the pharynx and the esophagus have their own problems and we are going to discuss uh, details of these two structures we should always be concerned about the future and everybody wishes you a uh, bright good future and for this future to be bright we need to prepare for the future preparing for the future is uh, the main task of the medical school in order to face the real world so preparing for the future is an effort and we are going to try to prepare you to make this effort this effort is mainly based on understanding of knowledge not memorizing the facts hopefully uh, I want to think that you have already uh, seen the first session about what doctors do and here is uh, the summary of what doctors do and it is very important to uh, understand very very well as our goal is to be qualified as doctors we should do what doctors do now the summary is ask questions always ask questions you will be asking questions all your lives and then collect data data collection is your job you are going to collect data all your life data collection should be a rich collection because the devil is in the details and the disease is a devil if you live on summaries or what your teacher teaches you what comes out of his mouth you may think it is enough it is not so collecting data is the job of the doctors to be and it is the raw material we work with and when we collect data we stop and think about it this is a very important process because when we think about the data we can extract the truth out of the data and then we have to put relevant data in place that is integration and we should share sharing is very important and it happens every day in the medical practice so that we reach the truth and if somebody has a wrong idea when he shares it uh, his colleagues or her colleagues are going to correct the, the wrong impressions and we need to discuss hopefully you have seen the first session and these were explained in details the theme of this PowerPoint presentation is critical thinking what is critical thinking it is reading materials as answers to questions reading any material without asking questions is useless in medicine because it is not going to be understood and it is not going to be stuck in the mind therefore critical thinking basic rule is asking questions and looking for answers or reading answers and asking uh, the questions uh, otherwise we are going to learn general knowledge we are not going to enter the space of understanding questions and answers is doctors way of thinking they are the basic rules of acquiring knowledge and questions and answers are the daily bread and butter activity of doctors questions and answers will open the door for you to acquire knowledge to feed your intelligence and when you combine the knowledge with intelligence you are going to lift up the activity or your brain to the level of wisdom have a look at this quotation and let us uh, learn something about it science is a way of thinking it is much more than a body of knowledge therefore 
if we know a lot and our knowledge is not thought of thinking of knowledge is a process processing knowledge is very important in medicine and it involves several activities one of the utmost important is integration you put relevant knowledge in connection to each other so that you can come to a stage of understanding at this point of time it is a bit too late to move on move on to what move on several steps towards our goal that means we have to be prepared to take few steps towards our goal of becoming doctors if we don't move on then we are going to stay in our place and don't ever think that the goal is going to come down to you it is not you have to take a few steps towards the goal towards real medicine and real life ideas of medicine are extensive they are very branching and they are dynamic they change quite quickly at this point of time in the 21st century so we are supposed to, to have the very basic truth of a subject and we work on it and we do more collection of data we integrate we process we put it in a programs and a new way of thinking until the idea gets bigger during this process of working on science now the ideas will shine shiny ideas are ideas that are well understood and they are going to stay forever and used every day in the future who is going to do this it is you we in the medical school we give you a helping hand some instructions and some more references for more information and that is the right way memorizing black lines on white paper is not going to make you step forward for your future not even uh, a centimeter this image represents types of ideas in our brain in the process of becoming doctors shiny ideas are ideas that are understood and they will stay shining all our lives there are ideas which are not shining we should be working on these ideas and make them shine uh, it is hard work but we can do it and we have no choice but to do it there are clouds in which these ideas are empty and we have no idea about them overall the more shiny ideas we have the further steps we are going up towards our goal and that is becoming safe doctors the more shiny ideas you have the more successful doctors you are the more the patients are going to be well treated and satisfied we as doctors in a society we usually study very hard and work very hard to achieve a goal and that is to be qualified as doctors look at this image the patient is very grateful and smiling and the doctor is very proud uh, that his or her patient is happy think of this idea and you should be able at the end of your <coughs> stay in the medical school to be having a face like the face of this lady doctor one of the, the wrong ideas that some maybe more medical students think is that memorize sentences memorize facts while this is not going to lead anywhere the key is integrate if you look at the face of this young girl and ask yourself what is she doing she is thinking of how to integrate pieces of the jigsaw puzzle so that this integration makes sense 
if we are born with this character, with this talent, why don't we use it in our medical school and in earning science? This is an image of a 3D person crossing a line and putting his toes across the line. Why am I presenting this image? Because I am interested in uh, having a taste of the real world, a taste of the truth. Therefore, you will see that uh, most of the sources of information are going to be things that are used in the future, things when you go to the real medical atmosphere and the use of drawings with colors is going to be reduced to minimum. It's the future. That is the main concern and times go very fast and we should be prepared and adapt to this very important part of our lives and that is the future. Anatomy is a visual and descriptive science. What does visual mean? It means that we have to see something and we should describe it. We should see an image, a model, or a cadaver and we describe what are we seeing. This rule applies also to every patient you see. You look at the patient, you examine the patient, and you describe what you see. It is a process of collecting information. This is the bread and butter. This is our daily food every day in our lives. And this is a very basic thing that we should be experts in. Otherwise, we are going to face difficulties. The next very if logical anatomy question is, visual is and descriptive what do I do now? And it is a very study an basic image. fact. Therefore, Never study what do I do now? Without study an, an image. accompanied image or, or a model or a cadaver anything. or a model and never and study anatomy study without the an naming of structures. Something to be write down your described. notes on paper and you cannot this treat way you will learn patients a lot. on the phone. Do not you have study to see anatomy the patient without examine an image or something and describe to you what you, you see. listen and you write down Therefore, your observations. Studying anatomy as black lines on white paper as a group of students prefer, they say, we are not going to see this lecture, we are not going to go anywhere, somebody is going to write down what, what I am saying and they start memorizing it. That is uh, end of the road. That is not going to take you anywhere. So, study naming of structures and there is an important step and that is write your notes. When you hold a piece of paper and a pen and you go back to your mind to collect and integrate what you have described, this is a very useful exercise and you will be learning a lot. Look at these two stories. There's a right story and a wrong one. If you are going to download what I say, the information that comes off my mouth. You co somebody is going to collect it for you. You are going to put it in your head and then you close the box. Nobody knows what's in it or how much information uh, is there in this closed box. That is a wrong way of learning anything. But if you collect data, what comes out of my mouth, what's in the book, what's on the net, and then you sit down with your colleagues and uh, your friends and you analyze and discuss. We, as a group in a lecture, we do data management. The data you have collected and we try to organize it so that it makes a reasonable, credible shape. At the end of the day, the medical science of any branch or any part is yours. It is the way you are preparing to become a good doctor. It is not anybody's else. You are not making favor to anybody when you earn science. You are making a favor to yourself. Therefore, you have 
to work on it and make it shine when it shines it's going to be useful and we need people with shiny ideas in the last 17 slides my intention was to give you tips of how to study and how to become a good doctor it is up to you please feel free take it or leave it when you leave it do what you like follow your instinct and uh, take responsibility of what you are doing either take responsibility of taking it and accepting it or leaving it back to real life what is this view I'm sure by this time you know where you are at the, f the floor the bottom of the image you find the tongue the striking feature is the uvula and the soft palate and you can see the anterior arch and the posterior arch of the soft palate where is the tonsils the tonsils are normal size and they do not show beyond the anterior arches of the soft palate but from your pathology you know that there are signs of acute inflammation and these signs include redness dilated blood vessels and in this case it is pharyngitis if you look between the two posterior arches you are facing the oropharynx so the inflammatory process is involving the soft palate and the pharynx usually the patient feels pain in the throat and contraction of these structures are going to produce pain especially on swallowing the main action of these structures another problem what questions should we ask ourselves first is where are we we are in the mouth approaching the posterior part of the mouth going towards the fauces and identify the tongue which is inferior the uvula the part of the soft palate is so obvious and if we look at go through the fauces and go into the oropharynx you can see these red uh, large spots these are enlarged lymphoid tissues in the wall of the pharynx and this is a case of what is called follicular pharyngitis what's wrong here first of all we ask ourselves where are we we are at the back of the mouth we can see the tongue depressed in the middle and we can see the uvula if you look at the sides you can see that the two palatine tonsils are enlarged and inflamed why enlarged because they are approaching each other near the midline and we have seen in previous uh, images that a normal tonsil cannot be seen beyond the arches of the soft palate here they are way beyond the arches of the soft palate and still if you go and see part of the oropharynx facing you is also inflamed and if you are not sure compare the color of the pharynx to the color of the tongue and you can see that the pharynx is reddish what is this image telling me and where am I now where is this image is something you know by now for the following reasons you can see the tongue and you can see the uvula and you can see the roof of of the mouth and what else can you see you can see that the soft palate is very red blood vessels are dilated and there is a hemorrhagic spot on your upper left part near the question mark this is a hemorrhagic spot and you can see these whitish uh, spots these are collection of pus under the covering epithelium and therefore this is a bacterial infection of the soft palate of course the same process is going on the pharynx side of this structure here is uh, another image of a disease you have just seen and it's a practice for you to ask yourself where is this problem what is this problem especially if you look at the tips of these arrows and 
uh, you can recall what is the name of this condition. In the future, patients are not colored. They are not labeled. And when you have a deep problem, you don't sagittal section the patient. But you resort to the modern ways of visualizing things. And you know what is this. This is a sagittal section of the part of the head and the neck and the face. And we, w we need to read the information we can get out of this magnetic resonance image. And the first question is, do you know where you are? The answer is simple thinking and analysis will lead you to the answers. What is this? This is the external nasal opening going into the nasal cavity and the posterior part of the nasal cavity opens into the nasal pharynx, the superior part of the pharynx. Why is the pharynx is black in area? Because it contains air. Nothing prevents the x-ray from uh, reaching the film. Therefore, when you develop it, or the computer will show it as black. It's black because it contains air. If you go to the roof of the nasopharynx, you find that the nasopharynx is just inferior to this part of the skull, and you should be able to know what part of the skull is this. If you go to your right, you can see the bones. So the bones is sitting on this structure, and this is the clivus. What is the clivus made of? You have to activate your previous knowledge of parts of the skull. It is made of the basal part of the occipital bone and the upper part of the sphenoid bone. Now, if you go lower down, uh, the green arrow is indicating that the posterior wall of the nasopharynx is anterior to the atlas and the axis. This is the opening of the mouth. At the tip of the arrow is the tongue. And you can see the hole of the tongue. And then you go posteriorly and you reach the posterior one-third of the tongue, which is in the oropharynx. And then you go lower down. The tip of the arrow here is pointing at a cartilage of the larynx. This is the epiglottis and the black area posterior to the epiglottis is the laryngopharynx. If you go down, you can see that the last arrow is pointing at a structure full of air, and this is the trachea. While <coughs> you go more posterior to the trachea, the structure indicated by the green arrow is uh, a thick structure. It is not black because it is made of thick tissues, and that is the beginning of the esophagus. Again, this is a CT scan of the head and neck, and the image is going to tell us lots of things, and we need to read it with our knowledge. And we ask questions. What is this arrow indicating? It is indicating the nose, and the tip of the arrow is do you know what? It is the inferior concha. And the space of the nose opens posteriorly through the quena, the posterior nasal opening into the nasal pharynx. Now, this is the tongue, quite obvious. And this is what? This is the heart palate. And what is this structure? It is the soft palate, the valvular like structure. And from the tongue, you go posteriorly, and the arrow here is indicating the oropharynx. Then, what is next? Look at the next arrow. It is pointing at what? It is pointing at the epiglottis cartilage of the larynx. Now, wait for the next arrow. It's a space between the tongue and the epiglottis. This space is called vellicula, and we're going to see it in the next few slides as well. Now, wait for the next arrow. The black space posterior to the epiglottis is the 
what? It's the laryngopharynx. Next arrow is indicating that uh, <coughs> larynx leads downward to the trachea filled with air. Next is the structure marked by the green arrow, which is posterior to the trachea, anterior to the vertebral column. This is the esophagus. And at the tip of the green arrow, you see there is air in the esophagus. Uh, this person has swallowed air while the CT scan has been taken. What is next? The tip of this green arrow is pointing to what? If you have understood your musculoskeletal system, this is the first vertebra, and the tip of the green arrow is pointing at the anterior arch of atlas. Then wait for the next arrow. This is the dense, the axis, the C2 vertebra. This is C3, C4, C5, C6. At C6, the pharynx ends. The laryngopharynx ends and the esophagus starts. So the esophagus starts in the neck. Questions. What is this image? This is a magnetic resonance image. Now you know what structures are visible in this image. And at the end of description of the parts of the pharynx, it may be useful to summarize that the pharynx is made of nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Here it is called hypopharynx. Questions and answers. That's the way we learn. What is this? This is a cross section of the head taken by a CT scan. Now, where are we? You should be able to know the landmarks of this place. This arrow is indicating the external ear, and the second arrow is indicating the, the nose. Let's wait for the next arrow. This is the nasal septum, and on both sides you see the nasal conchi. And then when you go posteriorly, you are going to find this yellow circle indicating the space of the nasopharynx. What is the next arrow pointing at? It is pointing at the black area indicating the space of nasopharynx. What is next? This little arrow is pointing at uh, a structure on both sides of the coena, the posterior nasal opening, and these are the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone. Here is the other one, waiting for the next arrow. This arrow is going posteriorly and laterally from the nasopharynx and then at the tip of the arrow you can see that there is a dark canal. This is the Eustachian tube connection between the nasopharynx and the middle ear. Here is the other side, Eustachian tube. And do you know what structure is this? This is, uh, we have talked about uh, a few slides ago. This is the clivus. Can you see anything? else yes you can if you have understood your uh, nervous system you can see that this is part of cerebellum and between the two lobes of the cerebellum you will see the medulla oblongata the last is the posterior wall of the nasopharynx which is made of groups of muscles called prevertebral group of muscles that is concerned with flexion of uh, the neck part of the vertebral column plus the posterior wall of the nasopharynx. Let us read this image by questions and answers. Do you know the view of the skull? That is the basal view. And what do you think this red marked area is? We will see. The next arrow is coming from the posterior nasal opening, indicating that the red area is uh, the roof of the nasopharynx. And here is the other side, posterior nares. Then we have the lateral wall of the nasopharynx, the right and left, and the posterior wall, 
posterior wall is going to show that it is attached to the clivus and the superior part of the nasopharynx is attached to a single point on the inferior surface of the clivus which is called the pharyngeal tubercle let's wait for the next arrow it is an extension from the posterior part of the nasopharynx towards the middle ear this is the stachian tube and here is the other side questions what is this image showing it is showing a freshly dissected human cadaver in which area it is a sagittal section of the area of the nose and here is the beginning coming from the external nares pointing at the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and this is the inferior turbinate or inferior concha and the tip of the arrow is going to point at the nasopharynx here is the nasopharynx and the next question is what are the features of the nasopharynx the answer is <coughs> at the tip of this arrow it is an opening of the stachian tube going towards the middle ear uh, embryologically the middle ear is an extension of the nasopharynx something we will see when we talk about development of the head and neck around the opening of the stachian tube into the nasopharynx there are lymphoid follicles and they are called the tubal tonsils then we can see that this arrow is coming from the clivus and the tip is pointing at a longitudinal elevation uh, <coughs> this is a muscle covered by the mucous membrane of the nasopharynx the muscle is coming from the cartilaginous portion of the stachian tube uh, and coming down to uh, get into the inside of the pharynx it is one of three longitudinal muscles of the pharynx what is this view first of all since it is circular uh, and the tissues are pink and look lively and glistening uh, this is a endoscopic image the endoscope went into one of the nasal cavities and went back and took an image of the <coughs> posterior wall of the nasopharynx and here we are this is the nasal septum on one side and this is the floor of the nasal cavity and if you look here uh, the arrow is indicating uh, an anterior view of the tubal opening the eustachian tube opening and you can see that on the posterior wall there are pinkish elevations irregular in shape these are the pharyngeal tonsils the other name for it is uh, the adenoids what is this image showing me it is showing me two circular images and what are these images these are endoscopic images of the side wall of the nasopharynx pointing at the uh, beginning or the foramen of the eustachian tube connecting the nasopharynx to the middle ear and one has to take care that infection of the nasopharynx can easily spread to the middle ear especially if we know that there are lymphoid tissue around the opening of this the eustachian tube if they get larger they block the eustachian tube and uh, several problems will take place in the middle ear especially in children what sort of questions can you ask yourself you can ask yourself where's the nose where's the mouth where's the heart palate where is the tongue where is the epiglottis where's the vellicula where is the stachian tube opening if you go to the nasal septum and go towards your left the nasal septum will end and you will have the nasopharynx uh, superior to the soft palate and you can see this is the opening of the stachian tube what is this image telling me first of all this is the first figure of the nasopharynx uh, you are seeing in this presentation uh, let's 
look at the arrows in and indicating what this yellow arrow is indicating the opening of uh, the pharyngeal orifice of the Eustachian tube and this green arrow is indicating that uh, the <coughs> posterior and superior part of the nasopharynx is very much related and attached to the uh, the clivus the part of the bone made by the sphenoid and the occipital and in this area you will find the pharyngeal tonsil or the adenoids this is the adenoid lymphoid tissue of the nasopharynx this is called pharyngeal tonsil what about this arrow it is indicating the elevation made by a muscle coming from the cartilaginous part of the stachian tube inserting into the uh, constrictors of the pharynx and this is uh, the lower part of the fold and it is called the salpingopharyngeal fold what about the anterior part of the soft of the pharynx it is going to be the soft palate when it is hanging down from the hard uh, palate questions do you know this section yes we have just had it few uh, prior slides it is a sagittal section in a freshly dissected human body and what are we looking for we are looking for this yellow marked structure and it is in the posterior and superior wall of the nasopharynx it's a collection of lymphoid follicles called the pharyngeal tonsil or the adenoids uh, <coughs> they are single and in the midline questions of course I know where this place is and the red swollen structure is the pharyngeal tonsil which is getting large and large enough to block the nasopharynx now in this case uh, the person will become a mouth breather and the quality of air going down the respiratory system will get less good because it is missing the functions of the nose questions what is this image this is an x-ray of mainly the face part of the skull and part of cervical vertebra now what is the problem here let's go and identify the upper teeth the space above the upper teeth is the nasal cavity and the nasal cavity goes posterior to reach the uh, structure marked with the bold black lines and uh, we go and identify the clivus and then we see that inside this uh, clivus that there is a shadow of soft tissue how do I know because it is whitish it is supposed to be black but here it is whitish therefore the adenoids or the palatine tonsils sorry the pharyngeal tonsils are large and nearly blocking uh, the nasopharynx do I know what sort of image is this the answer is yes it's an x-ray mainly of the body of the sphenoid you can see up the cella torsica and you can see down and to the right there is a black hole that is the external auditory meatus and if you go inferior to the clivus which is the position of the pharyngeal tonsil you can see this white star is pointing at an enlarged pharyngeal tonsil and you go lower down you see the black star indicating what remains of the uh, nasopharynx posterior to the soft palate hanging down now describing this image and asking questions about it is to be left to you to practice identifying the different areas and the areas of the nose and nasopharynx you know what is this section it is a sagittal view of freshly dissected cadaver and this arrow is indicating the nasopharynx with the opening of the stachian tube what is the next arrow will point at it is pointing at the soft palate hanging down from the hard palate the green marked structure what is next the tongue 
here is the tongue showing itself as a mass of muscular tissue and part of it is anterior under the heart palate and the lower and left part is in the oropharynx what structure is going to be next the oropharynx posterior to one-third of the tongue next is the epiglottis the <coughs> flap like elastic cartilage of the larynx just posterior and inferior to the tongue next is the vocal cords the inside of the larynx this is just to activate your knowledge of the larynx and then is the space posterior to the larynx which is the laryngopharynx and then you could lower down below the pharynx posterior to the trachea is the esophagus this is a normal living posterior opening of the mouth showing the oropharynx what is this we will know what is this and all the details after we ask ourselves questions and we extract answers from the image why is this image circular it is because it is an endoscopic image the endoscopic tip is introduced into the mouth reaching the most posterior part of the mouth and having a look at the oropharynx and the inferior structure in this image is the tongue which part of the tongue it is the posterior one-third of the tongue which is in the oropharynx look at the surface of the tongue is it smooth like the anterior two-thirds you have seen when we studied the mouth the answer is no it has elevations what are these elevations these are collections of lymphoid tissue and collectively they are called the lingual tonsil then let's see the next arrow the green arrow is pointing at the tip of the epiglottis the epiglottic cartilage that makes the valve closing and opening the beginning of the larynx and this is usually uh, when it goes up it becomes nearer to the tongue is it going to touch the tongue the answer is no there is a space between the posterior one-third of the tongue and the epi epiglottis and this is called the vellicula so what's the vellicula you answer that it is a space between posterior one-third of the tongue and the epiglottis of the larynx now this vellicula is divided into two halves a right and left one by a fold of the mucous membrane which is called the median IAN glossoepiglottic fold connecting the tongue to the epiglottis so we have a right part of the vellicula and a left part of the vellicula this curved yellow arrow is indicating the lateral glossoepiglottic fold and we have another one on the left side now let's wait and see the next arrow will be pointing at what it is pointing at a fossa a depression on the side of the larynx and this fossa is called piriform fossa it is a space on the side of uh, the larynx and if anything is stuck here uh, must be taken out because coughing will not bring it out neither swallowing what is next this white curve is indicating the <coughs> posterior part of the laryngeal inlet made by the two retinoid cartilages and you can see that between the epiglottis and the retinoid uh, cartilages you can see the vocal cords are opened and this is the way to the larynx what is the way to the larynx it is between epiglottis and retinoid cartilages what is next next is that posterior 
to the arytenoid cartilages is going to be the way to the esophagus. So the space around the larynx is the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is going to lead to the esophagus. Let's ask questions about this image. This is, of course, a living endoscopic image of the oropharynx where you can see that this is the tongue and you can see the lingual tonsils and this is of course the glottic cartilage and here is one pellicula and this is the median glossoepiglottic fold. Let's see what is the next arrow pointing at. It is pointing at the lateral glossoepiglottic fold and this is the other one. What sort of image is this? Now you know. Now let's see what we are going to highlight here. It is the pellicula. What is this image is going to show me? Uh, let's have an overall summary. Which structure is this? This is the hard palate. And posterior to it, the yellow marked structure is the soft palate. What is next? It's the tongue. You see the tongue as a big muscular organ. What am I going to see next? I'm going to see that the nasopharynx is opened in the lower part to the oropharynx posterior to the soft palate. What is the next step? The nasopharynx is going to be connected to the oropharynx just behind or posterior to posterior third of the tongue. What is next? Next is the larynx. You can see the epiglottis and you can see the false vocal cord and inferior to it is the true vocal cord. What is the next structure to be pointed at? The laryngopharynx posterior to the larynx and the tip of this arrow is pointing at the beginning of the esophagus. The esophagus begins as it is marked here green uh, <coughs> in the lower part of the neck. This is the horizontal yellow line demarcates the end of the esophagus, the end, sorry, the end of the pharynx and the beginning of the esophagus. This is a diagram. It is not a cadaver or an endoscopic. This is a diagram and uh, I will leave it to ask questions, especially what is the next arrow pointing at. And it is a very good practice slide. Now, have we seen this image before? The answer is yes. And we know what it is and where we are and what kind of section do we have here. But uh, the next step is going to highlight what is the pharyngeal tonsils or the adenoids and it is in the superior and posterior part of the nasopharynx and this green arrow is pointing at the end of the nasal septum and the nasopharyngeal cavity. We know this picture but what is it going to highlight for us? The answer is this is the soft palate and the palatine tonsils, one on the right and one on the left between the two pillars of the soft palate, the anterior arch and the posterior arch. We are now familiar with this section, but what is going to be highlighted here? It is pointing at the posterior one third of the tongue, which is in the oropharynx and inside this figure is uh, the lingual tonsil in the posterior one-third of the tongue. This is a diagram. If you look at the figure to the left, it is a drawing and it shows that the top of the nasopharynx has pharyngeal tonsil and then 
in the blue area just inferior to the pharyngeal tonsil there is a blue color area this is indicating what is called the tubal tonsil the lymphoid tissue around the opening of the eustachian tube then lower down the soft palate is the orange area which is the palatine tonsils and then the lowest blue area is the posterior one-third of the tongue and this is the lingual tonsils now we go to the right and we can see that the lingual tonsil is most anterior then on both sides of the fauces we have the palatine tonsils one on the right and one on the left then when we go posterior we see the two tubal tonsils at the opening of the stachian tube and the most posterior single one is the pharyngeal tonsil this is uh, a group of lymphoid tissue concerned with immunity and it makes a circle around the beginning of the alimentary system and this circle is called circle of wall dyer this is an endoscopic image visualizing the vocal cords which are opened and posteriorly these are the arytenoid cartilages attaching the vocal cords and moving them and if you go lateral to the lateral wall of the larynx you see the piriform fossa we're going to talk about the piriform fossa because when something is stuck there the patient will be very much irritated and neither coughing nor swallowing anything will remove this foreign body and doctors they need to go to the piriform fossa pick the foreign body and take it out This is a cadaveric image that shows uh, lots of features, but we will go through it by questions and answers. Now, we are going to look at the first arrow and see what is it pointing at. It is pointing at the soft palate. Why this is the soft palate? Because I can see the uvula hanging down, and this is the space of nasopharynx. Then, let's wait for the next arrow. This is the tongue why is this the tongue because it is inferior to the uvula and it is having a regular surface as the lingual tonsils what is next this is the epiglottis the valvular uh, structure of the larynx next is the median glossoepiglottic fold and after it is the vellicula space on both sides of the median glossoepiglottic fold and this is the lateral glossoepiglottic fold this is what this is a normal lateral x-ray of the neck the black arrow is indicating at the epiglottis and the structure inside the white oval shape is a membrane connecting the margin of the epiglottis to the arytenoid cartilage and this is the ari epiglottic fold preventing things from go going into the larynx from the sides now you know this is a lateral x-ray of the neck and we will ask a few questions can you see the nasal cavity and nasopharynx the answer is yes I can see it can you see the soft palate yes I can see it can you see the blackish area of the cavity of the parts of the pharynx yes I do what is this structure this is the epiglottis now in this section at the tip of this uh, yellow arrow can see the greater wings of the hyoid bone and then of course this is the oropharynx because it is posterior to the tongue and this is the vellicula space between the epiglottis and the tongue we will ask ourselves several questions we saw the different structures on the inside of the pharynx and now we will open the posterior wall and see 
the same structures but uh, in drawings. This is the piriform fossa on the side of the larynx, to be exact, on the side of ari epiglottic folds. This is the piriform fossa. Again, what is this view? This is a, a view of the pharynx opened from the posterior side, and you can see the opening of the larynx, the laryngeal inlet, and you can see that the piriform fossa is on the side of the larynx. Things stuck here must be removed. <coughs> you know this image is an x-ray of the lateral view of the neck, but this is an x-ray of a patient. The patient was eating uh, a fish meal and suddenly he felt something stuck in his neck. And this yellow arrow is indicating a fish bone stuck in the pharynx. Now, the tip of the fish bone has pierced the wall of the pharynx and therefore the pharynx is a common pathway for food and air and therefore air uh, went into the space around the pharynx and this is called parapharyngeal space or prevertebral space. Here is another problem with a patient with has a needle stuck in his uh, laryngopharynx and this is the oropharynx and here is the tip one of the tips of the needle and here is the other tip of the needle and the black and white arrow is indicating the middle of the needle. We have been looking at the inside of the different parts of the pharynx. Now we intend to look at what is the wall of the pharynx made of. The wall of the pharynx is made of a group of constrictors made of three muscles superior constrictor, middle constrictor, and inferior constrictor. The three muscles have oblique course, and we have another set of muscles, also three muscles, uh, that are perpendicular, coming from the base of the skull and getting into the pharynx from the inside. Let's have a look at this diagram, which shows that uh, the pharynx is a funnel-shaped structure, nearly funnel-shaped, not exactly, and it's made of three uh, areas uh, with overlapping three constrictor muscles and getting narrower, lower down to join the esophagus. The superior part is the superior constrictor that is opening into the nose and is called the nasopharynx. Then lower down is the oropharynx made of the middle constrictor and opens into the mouth. And the third part is the laryngopharynx, which is posterior to the larynx. These three regions made of three constrictors, and they <coughs> get narrow and uh, join the esophagus at a narrow point. It is like more or less a funnel shaped. If we look at this arrow, this is the point of overlap between the three constrictors. This is an overlap between the superior and middle one, and this is an overlap between the middle and the inferior constrictor. And in these areas of overlap, uh, structures pass from outside the pharynx into the inside. What is this image and what is this structure? We're going to ask ourselves and try to extract information from the slide. What specimen is this? This is a posterior view of the pharynx uh, in a, a, a cadaver. The vertebral column has been removed and uh, what we see is a posterior view of the pharynx. The three constrictors of the pharynx come from three sets of origin and they curve and they turn posteriorly and meet in a central uh, fibrous tissue called the pharyngeal raphi. Let's see what is next. This arrow is pointing at the superior constrictor and the superior constrictor on both sides, they get narrow and attach to the uh, inferior surface of the clivus at a single point, uh, which 
make a tubercle on the inferior surface of the clivus called the pharyngeal tubercle. Then we have the middle constrictor opposite the oropharynx and the inferior constrictor opposite the uh, larynx. <coughs> the fibers are oblique coming anteriorly and going posteriorly and upward. Uh, this arrangement is going to help the normal physiology of the pharynx in squeezing the bolus down to the esophagus. On the sides of the pharynx in the neck, we find the neurovascular bundle made of the carotid sheath and the vagus and higher up at the level, just inferior to the base of the skull, we find the glossopharyngeal nerve and the hypoglossal nerve as well. This is a diagram of the posterior view of the pharynx. Now, we would ask questions to extract knowledge out of this image. Uh, this is the median pharyngeal raphi, which is on the posterior side of the pharynx. Let's see uh, what the next arrow is going to point at. It is going to point at the pharyngeal raphi. What is next? Next is the superior constrictor as it comes from its origin and joins the pharyngeal raphi. And there is a gap between the upper border of the superior pharyngeal constrictor and the base of the skull. This gap is made of uh, fascia, a thick fascia. Why? It is because the nasopharynx is a respiratory passage and it should not collapse. Therefore, it is not surrounded by a muscle because if muscle contracts, it's going to squeeze the space. So this is called the pharyngeobasilar fascia. Pharyngeo because it makes the uppermost part of the pharynx and basilar is a description of its attachment to the base of the skull. And this is the pharyngeobasilar fascia of the other side. And then we have the middle constrictor, which comes from the hyoid bone, goes posteriorly, and as it goes posteriorly, it goes superiorly as well to be attached to the uh, middle pharyngeal raphi. And then we have the inferior constrictor, which is going from the th thyroid cartilage going posteriorly and superiorly to join the median pharyngeal raphi. And <coughs> as we go down the pharynx, we expect uh, the point of joining with the esophagus. Therefore, the lower fibers of the inferior constrictor is going to be horizontal or circular. And it is coming from the cricoid cartilage going posteriorly, but not going up makes a circular ring and that is the cricopharyngeal part of the inferior constrictor and this is the first point of uh, the esophagus joining the, the pharynx and it is a constricted area you see the esophagus has three areas of constrictions this is number one and you can see that there's a gap between the superior and the middle constrictors and the perpendicular muscles of the pharynx come from outside the pharynx and go in through the gap between the upper two constrictors. Here is a more detailed uh, description of posterior view of the pharynx. Uh, and we want to ask ourselves questions so that we find our way through. The first arrow here is indicating the clivus and the inferior surface is the pharyngeal tubercle. and the next is the superior pharyngeal constrictor, one on the right, one on the left. And uh, they meet in the <coughs> uh, median pharyngeal raphi. And the superior constrictor comes from medial pterygoid plate, because this is at the level of the base of the skull. And the pterygomandibular raphi is a band of connective tissue between uh, the lower end of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid down to the mandible and the mylohyoid line of the mandible. These are the three points of origin of the superior pharyngeal constrictor. And the, uh, these muscle fibers go to the pharyngeal tubercle. And this is the pharyngeal tubercle inside the white circle. Then the superior constrictor also has uh, uh, an attachment to the base of the skull, not in the middle line only, but on the sides as well, on both sides. 
what is next? We know this, that the, pharyng the pharyngeal constrictors, they all insert in the median uh, pharyngeal raphi. Then we have the uppermost part of the nasopharynx is made of pharyngeobasilar fascia because it is a respiratory passage. Then we have the middle constrictor. The middle constrictor is coming from the hyoid bone, the stylohyoid ligament, and goes to the midline pharyngeal raphi. The gap between the superior constrictor and the inferior constrictor, because these muscles overlap, the perpendicular muscles of the pharynx will pass from outside the pharynx to the inside. Then we have the inferior constrictor. The inferior pharyngeal constrictor comes from the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, and they go posteriorly and upward to meet the midline pharyngeal raphi. The lowest part, as we have just described, uh, comes from the lateral surface of the cricoid cartilage, and they run horizontally. And this is a constricted area indicating the beginning of the esophagus. All these are answers to the questions we have already described. Again, this is a closer look to what we have described, and it is a good exercise for you to go through it alone and ask the proper question like, which structure is this? Which tubercle is this? What is this structure? And then look at this green arrow pointing at what? You answer this question, what is this muscle? And what is this muscle? And there is a third which you cannot see on this view. And this is a muscle not related to the pharynx, it is related to the hide bone. This is a view of the posterior view opened, a longitudinal opening in the midline pharyngeal raphi, where you can see what? This is which part? This is the nasopharyngeal part because you can see the posterior coena, you can see the nasal septum, and you can see the uh, two conchi, two nasal turbinates. And then this is the oropharynx because I can see the soft palate uvula and posterior one third of the tongue with the lingual tonsils. And this is the laryngopharynx. This is a, a view showing what? It shows that the posterior part of the pharynx has been opened and you can see your way. For example, this is the soft palate. Why this is the soft palate? Because it has a uvula. And what is this structure? This is the epiglottis of the larynx. And this arrow is indicating the pathway when a piece of food or anything that goes down and uh, get stuck in the piriform fossa. Piriform fossa is on the side of the larynx, and you can see it at the tip of the curved uh, yellow arrow. That's the piriform fossa. Another, another view of the opened uh, pharynx posteriorly, where you can see that the arrows are pointing at the piriform fossa sometimes called piriform recess. We have seen this uh, fossa because uh, sometimes people will come to you and they say we have something stuck in our pharynx, in our neck. You should have good knowledge of uh, where to find this foreign body. This is also a posterior view of the pharynx where you can see that on both sides uh, there is a neurovascular bundle containing uh, contents of the carotid sheath, uh, multiple nerves coming from uh, the jugular foramen, uh, the vagus, the glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, and the nerve coming from a special canal, the hypoglossal. And also you can see the sympathetic trunk. Now, here is the very important step. We have talked about the pharynx 
from so many points of view we looked at it from inside through endoscopic images and we looked at it in sagittal sections and then we looked at it from the posterior view we opened the posterior view and we saw so many structures now it is time to check your understanding take a piece of paper and a pen and write what you have understood and the best way is to mind map what you have learned because the mind map will tell you what you know and what you don't know then uh, because the pharynx is a, a voluntary structure made of voluntary muscles uh, we need to know the pharyngeal plexus of nerves we are not saying nerve that supplies the pharynx we are saying a plexus because it is made of uh, a mesh like network shared by more than one nerve pharyngeal branches of glossopharyngeal nerve the glossopharyngeal nerve is mainly sensory but supplies only a single skeletal muscle which is the stylopharyngeus and then the vagus the vagus is uh, the main motor supply to the pharynx and we have sympathetic trunk which is going to supply the smooth muscles of the blood vessels now the motor part is mainly for all muscles of the pharynx except the stylopharyngeus which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve and the glands are supplied by the vagus that bring parasympathetic stimulation and blood vessels uh, smooth muscle are supplied by the sympathetic trunk sharing in the pharyngeal plexus and then sensory the main sensory nerve supply is the glossopharyngeal nerve especially the oropharynx and while the laryngopharynx is supplied by the vagus nerve the best way of organizing and integrating uh, the information of anything is a mind map and here is a mind map of the pharynx pointing at key very essential structures you can go through it like for example the green idea of location it is anterior to down to c6 and posterior to nose mouth larynx and it is inferior to base of the skull if you go to what is the pharynx the pharynx is a fibromuscular it is mainly muscular but the, the, the description of fibro came from the pharyngeal fascia the pharyngeobasilar fascia at the base of the skull making part of the wall of the nasopharynx and you can go through it just follow the lines it is very informative you may also copy it on a piece of paper so that you learn a lot of information We always need to learn more. We are very curious people and we never get satisfied from what we already know. And then we always need to activate our knowledge and it is a must to read a book, your textbook, because it adds to what I have said. And sometimes I've said things in addition and medical students read books. They have to and sooner or later, they are going to read books and the sooner the better.